Hello, hello. I see many people joining. And uh, yeah, we can uh, wait a bit to, to have everyone uh, to join. I will share uh, the board link. So if you want, you can go there and create your character. And yeah, give a name of it. It can be your name. It can be any name you want. Uh, you can go there and, and share it with everyone. For everyone that uh, just joined it, if you want, you can join the board. I'm sharing the link here in the chat and you can create your character there and share uh, with everyone. You can put a name, you can, yeah, put your name, another name. I can see already some nice characters here. It's nice, Dave. <laughs> this one <laughs> looks cool as well. Let's wait just two more minutes for more people to join.
<laughs> funny one, funny one. Yeah, I can see many funny characters here. It's really cool. I really like this character building uh, thing. It is really cool. Many options. So, uh, cool, I think uh, we can start. We have already uh, a good number of people. Everyone is joining. Uh, I will then uh, start to present here. You can come back uh, to the board, to the presentation. And uh, yeah, to start, welcome. Welcome uh, everyone to Miro Tech Talks. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much for, for joining. Uh, as, you, as you saw, today we're gonna have three presenters and let's start first uh, talking about what is the, the Miro Tech Talks. Uh, so basically it is an initiative to share and learn with the community. Uh, it started as an internal meeting uh, to get people together and share knowledge inside Miro. Uh, and also we start using it as a practice uh, place for presentation skills. So uh, we got many good presentations internally and we thought like, why not share it uh, externally and also open for receiving guests. Uh, and that's what we are doing today. So basically we wanna start this to start having events where we can share knowledge, we can learn with the community and yeah, we can do this together. And uh, our agenda uh, for today, uh, basically today, as you already saw, we are going to have a quiz in the start with chances to win a special Miro swag. So yeah, uh, let's see who is going to win. Uh, then we are going to have three uh, speakers today, Anna, uh, Eugene and uh, Andre. And in the end, I, I would like to share some links uh, with you about Miro careers and how to follow us uh, for next uh, present, next events. And then in the end, we can say goodbye. And yeah, uh, this will be the, the event for today. And to start, I think we can start with the quiz. So I'm gonna share here a link to the quiz in the chat. Let me get the link first. Yeah, so please join it and then I will start it and let's see uh, who, who, who is going to know and answer the questions correctly. Yeah, I just... Uh, I'm just waiting to see if everyone is joining. Please put your correct name here so then we can find you. If you win, we can find you later to give you the, the swag. So we need you to, to use your real name. Let's wait a bit more before it's still joining. Gonna share the link again, just to be sure. It's 
still wait just uh, one more minute and then we can start the quiz. I see people are still joining. Oh, cool. Oh. Share again. It's your last chance if you didn't join. Wait one more minute and then we will start. So, okay, I will start now. Let's see. Good luck, everyone. Just waiting a bit. I'm trying to start here, but it's not working. Let's see what's happening. I'm gonna refresh the page here. Oh, okay, it, it's working. Are you able to, to join? Because yeah, here, I'm not sure. I think maybe there is a problem with Slido. Please let me know. Yeah, I think I will stop and try to... Okay, so I will stop and try to start it again, sorry. Let's see now. Okay, I will I will try again. Cool. Now it should work. Let's see. What did the name Spotify or originally mean? Let's see the correct answer. And nothing, it was a misheard. Yeah, yeah. 30% <laughs> of the people uh, was correct. Let's see the leaderboard. Tatiana is in the leaderboard now. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna go to the next question. When is Tester's Day celebrated? Yeah, this one, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I also don't know. Let's see. And the correct answer is 9 September. Yeah, many people got it correctly this time. Let's see the leaderboard again. Oh, two correct. Wagner and Tatiana are in the top. Let's see, let's see the next ones. Verification is what do you think is the right answer for that? I'm also not sure. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so most of the people also got it right checking that we are building the system right. So yeah, this is the verification. And the leaderboard, oh, we have Wagner and Jin now in the top. So next, go to the next one. When did the history of modern quality assurance start? World War One, Two, Apple One, Apple, Apollo 11. Let's see.
And then the correct answer for that is World War II. So this one, not uh, many people got correct. I also thought it was Apollo 11. So yeah, let's see. And then we can get and see the leaderboard here. And cool. And then we have the winners of it. Maybe I click it, it wrongly, but yeah, we have uh, the boards here, Wagner, Vikash, and Lubov as the first, second, and third one. And uh, yeah, cool. Uh, we are gonna then contact uh, everyone that was in the leaderboard that was, uh, that got the correct uh, answers and did it faster as well. And then we are gonna send you some nice swags from Miro and yeah, some special things you're gonna be receiving at home. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your participation in the quiz. And yeah, cool. So now without further ado, uh, let's go to our first speaker of the day. And remembering as well that you can ask questions using the QA tab in the Zoom. So during the presentation, you can add the questions there. And let's go to our first speaker that today will be Anna. So Anna, when you're ready, you can uh, share your screen. Let me see here. Uh, let's see. I think Anna is not in the panelists. I, I promoted you, Anna. Let's see if it's going to work. Okay, nice. Yeah, can you cool, hear me? Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so let me share my screen and I think we can start. And yeah, I'll switch on my camera <laughs> for sure. Okay, yeah, I think that you can see me, right? Yep. Okay, nice. So today, sorry, we have a lot of things here. And here we are. Okay, so my name is Anna, and today we are going to talk about API testing approaches, and I will share my own experience. Um, how we can deal with API, how we can test that, and how we can organize yeah, the whole process. And of course, I will share our experience in Miro, what we are doing right now and what problems or what issues we struggle with. And of course, in the end, I will answer all your questions. So let's start. Uh, first of all, a um, couple of words about me. Uh, as I said, I'm Anna. Yeah, I'm, I'm really patient about testing. The thing is that I came to software engineering uh, from Python backend development, but after a year or two, I realized that I'm more into quality than just implementing some features. And I decided to switch to QA. And I really like this area. I try to develop myself. Yeah, I try to learn. Uh, as much as I can. And now I can say that I try to focus on APIs and I have been participating in a lot of projects. I tested not only web APIs, but also some microservices APIs, things like IoT, smart homes, etc. And I'm a teacher myself and I tried to conduct some courses in schools in Russian and English. And um, I can talk a lot, so I'll, I will try to limit myself to 20 minutes, but I can <laughs> talk a little bit more. And I really like the phrase that they put below. Um, somebody tells me, told me that um, this phrase was uh, said by um, Michael Bolton, but I'm not sure. There are a lot of authors yeah, who we can dedicate this phrase to. Um, so I think that testers do not break soft software. Yeah, and the whole presentation will be about approaches how to make the software better. Yeah, not only how to break that. And I think it's really important. Okay, I'll just move it somewhere here. Okay. So we have a lot of common problems, I think, in testing. And can you please just uh, put a sign, for example, like a plus in the chat, 
uh, let's say how many testers are here. Okay. Okay, wow, wow, great. A lot of. I think that my presentation will be helpful not only for testers, but for project managers, team leaders as well. But of course, it's dedicated more for testers because I'm, I am software tester myself. We have a lot of problems. And first of all, I think that if you have any automation in your project and you have UI tests, you can say that there are a lot of flaky and really long lasting tests. Yeah. And sometimes it can last forever. I know that a lot of projects have kind of 90 builds, for example, and the whole UI run can last three, four or five hours or even more. And we cannot say that the results can be 100% correct. Second thing, I think that you notice that, that all key engineers are really overloaded. Yeah, they are really busy. And I, I have seen a lot of configurations. Um, I used to work on one project where I was the only one tester and there were 13 or 14 developers. And it was crazy because I needed to conduct the manual testing, yeah, organize the whole process, write all the documentation like strategies, test cases, everything. And also um, all guys waited some automation from me. It was really crazy project, yeah, but I think that it was really good experience because they realized that we need to do something faster yeah and we need to implement some approaches how we can do that and in this presentation i will definitely share my experience with you the third thing and i think the most important and the most popular problem there is no strategy for automation testing sometimes you can have a strategy for the whole testing yeah but um, a lot of companies uh, don't have a quality architect, yeah, or you you call it, you can call it a lead automation engineer, yeah, who can build the strategy from scratch, and it's really important because you need to apply some tooling, you need to investigate a lot, for example, the development processes in your company, and of course it should be an experienced uh, manager or experienced tester, and if you don't have strategy, it might be a real pain, yeah, to implement automation, for example, from scratch. And I think the most painful point is that, okay, you have a strategy. Yeah, you have a lot of key engineers, they are really involved, but they are busy. So you want to involve your developers. And the thing is that they are busy too. Yeah, and they really don't want to uh, share your pain. Yeah, and be involved in testing as well, because uh, they have a lot of tasks on their plate um, with implementing some features. So it's a big problem and I will try to share my experience how I managed to involve them. Um, next problem is that test coverage sometimes is not sufficient or not transparent. You might have a lot of test cases in your test suits. You can have 1000, 2000 or even more, but it doesn't matter that you can see the whole picture that you can be sure that, okay, I have tested everything that I could. Yeah. And the thing is that sometimes it's not really clear how to build, yeah, how to build this uh, picture, your yeah, transparent picture from the beginning. And uh, one more thing um, if you have a lot of UI tests, you might uh, have noticed that, okay, well, we have a lot of UI tests, but uh, all modules are different. Interfaces for um, admin panel and for customer side are different and we need to start from scratch. Sometimes you have different frameworks, for example, front-end frameworks, I mean, uh, which you used and you cannot use, for example, Selenium tools yeah, for your customer side. So it can be a real problem as well. And of course, I don't say here that, okay, we can have different languages, programming languages that we can uh, use for our development in different teams. And the main problem for all, all these projects that I listed before is that sometimes we need to change the interfaces drastically. And we will have some new versions of our software with some incompatible changes. So in this case, all UI tests just fail, yeah, and you will need to resurrect them. It's really difficult. 
So today I'm going to tell you more about API testing. I think that mostly all of you are aware of it. Yeah, but uh, sometimes you just need to build up a strategy. Yeah, and how you can improve your process. And as I said, in the end, I will tell you how we do that in Miro and what was the previous state and where we are now. I just want to remind you about test pyramid. So it's a direct pyramid. Yeah, so we have a lot of unit tests below. Then we have some integration tests. And here we have functional tests, or we call them end-to-end -end tests, they, they are the same. And here you can see that I listed some responsible teams. Uh, in Miro, all unit tests are written by developers. I know that it's common, but I saw a lot of teams where testers are involved in unit testing as well. Second thing, integration tests. It may vary. Um, in Miro, only developers uh, write these tests, but I cannot say that integration tests are really good for testing business logic. They are more about integration and that's it. And this integration is concealed from customers' eyes. Yes, so they cannot see that. So all business logic is tested in functional testing. Yeah, in system testing, we can say that. And here we can say that not only QAs, as usual, are involved in Miro, but also developers. And of course, if you want to change something, if you want to involve more developers, you need to explain them how to do that. Yeah, what's the difference between integration testing and functional testing? What's the difference between unit testing and functional testing? And why cannot we just test the blocks and not try to build the whole house? And the thing is that uh, you might have uh, three different statuses if you experience some problems with testing in your project. First of all, you can have no tests. It's really common for a lot of startups, yeah, and uh, a lot of projects with MVP stage. That's all right. But sometimes you can come to the new project and you see a lot of implemented features, but no tests at all. So it will be the first case, and we will discuss how to deal with that. Second case, we will discuss, we have a lot of manual tests and no automation at all, and how to start the automation, what to think about. And the third thing, and it was our case, we had a lot of UI tests and not many tests for API. We had some, but I cannot say that the coverage was sufficient. So. Let's just try to think about all the cases. Let's focus on the first one and try to solve this problem. First of all, and um, I know that it's controversial, but for me, I think that testing is used for monitoring and reporting. Nobody really cares about your processes, but everybody cares about results. Everybody wants to see that, okay, our project is good, the quality is really high, or it's not so high and we need to highlight some weak spots. So first of all, we need to evaluate customer's needs. And here you need to decide who is the customer or what is a customer. So sometimes there might be uh, your stakeholders, yeah, so external people. Sometimes they can be your developers yeah, or managers, etc. And here, when you decide, for example, okay, this will be an external manager, you know, our customer, you need to think about results. What should you include to your test results? Maybe they can uh, see just a list of test cases, or maybe they need to see a demo so you can provide screenshots and videos, for example. Or if it is for internal use, for example, for your developers, they need to monitor the results. So it will be different. External customers, they don't really care about how many tests you ran. It's more about quality. Yeah, and you, you might have 1,000 or 5,000 tests, but if they find a bug, that's, that's not normal. But if you want to introduce some metrics and use tests for your own improvements, the results will be different. So first of all, 
um, you need to define stable parts of your system. Um, those crazy projects that I mentioned before with 13 developers and me only um, was really difficult to test because it was really changeable. We just overcame the stage of MVP and we got a lot of feedback from our customer, from his employees, and uh, we realized that we need to change everything. And all tests that I wrote, automated tests and um, just manual test cases were just thrown away. Yeah, and I needed to start from scratch. So first of all, you need to discuss stable parts. If you are not sure, that's all right. You can discuss it with your team lead or manager yeah, to have a strict timeline yeah, and a roadmap for the future changes. Second thing, you need to present a superficial strategy. It's really important. The thing is that uh, you need to introduce some tooling and also you need to introduce some responsibilities that you can take. For example, you can say that, okay, we are going to cover regression if you have some, or you don't have any regression, that's also all right. But you can say that, okay, we are going to cover these positive scenarios, but we are not going to cover all negative scenarios at all because we don't have time for that. We don't have any tests. Yes, so it's not our problem right now. And the customer or stakeholder, whatever, they should confirm that. Otherwise, you will meet a lot of problems after that. Yeah, that's um, why. Yeah, why negative scenarios are not tested? And why this affair is broken? Yeah, why this area is not tested properly? And so on. So it's really important. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's a basic thing, but I really sure that you need to confirm that and you need to discuss that. It can be a short document in Confluence or in Google Docs, it doesn't really matter, but everyone who is responsible, like team lead, like project manager and stakeholders should sign that. That's okay, they confirm that we should go this way. And the last thing here, you need to choose the most appropriate way for test cases for writing test cases, for introducing test cases. For example, our second talk will be about BDD. And I think that if you have no tests, it's really good solution because you will have the automation yeah, and the test cases simultaneously at the same place and the same time. And it is the first one. Second one, it might be not so uh, pleasant for you, but you can have an auto test with Cypress or with other framework. Um, I, I, I would say superficial framework, yeah, really um, high level framework and like a traceability metrics. The thing is that you will need to update it manually and it might be a problem for you. But if you can provide an integration, some links yet yeah, to test cases in your TMS, you can evaluate the coverage really easily. And what I really like about uh, traceability metrics that you don't need to have this ugly, big, large, I don't know, uh, enormous table anymore. You can use some proper tooling, modern tooling like mind maps, for example. Here I presented a short part of real mind map. Of course, I renamed. Uh, some things, but uh, the logic is the same. So you have an application, you can have different versions like V1, V2, etc. You can store your endpoints here, accounts, team, boards, your methods, maybe some additional parts of endpoints and your test cases. And here you can manually, yeah, I would, emphasizes again manually. We updated that and we used uh, some tooling like Miro, for example, just to collaborate together to mark that, okay, this test case is positive. We wrote that and here is the number. This test case is red because it's negative. And you can see uh, here that, okay, that should be really clear. Also, you can adjust some additional things like uh, borders, for example, for, for these nodes, or you can just put some comments that's okay, we need to update this test case, or this test case is the highest priority, or something like that. 
I think it might be sufficient for you if you have time to do it manually. And also, I would highly recommend to have a reference or a guideline how to use the mind map and how to update it. And if you have strict rules, and the, there are not really many, yeah, you should have three or four rules at least, you might really benefit from it. Because this mind map is clear for everyone, not only for testers, but for managers as well. They will see your progress. They will see your uh, tooling as well. Yeah, and th they will see how much coverage you have right now and what are the plans. Second thing, um, you might have a lot of manual test cases. And the thing is that it's a common uh, thing that, okay, I have a lot of test cases. I can just hire an automation engineer and we can just automate them. But things don't work like that. Yeah, uh, the first thing when you come to the new project as an engineer or as a manager, you will see that not all manual test cases can be easily automated. Sometimes you really need to refactor them. And uh, in Miro, we stick to the idea that we cannot just uh, throw the test cases away because we, we don't want to decrease the coverage. So maybe you should consider refactoring your manual test cases. Maybe you will need to add some uh, preconditions or some DB checks. Yeah, so you, you need to decide that. Second thing, you need to define the scope yeah, and the milestones. First of all, you can automate regression with P0 scenarios. Second thing, you can automate all negative checks and etc. And of course, you need to choose the tooling. And here I can say that there are a lot of approaches. I like approach of the common language for all developers. If you have a lot of server tests, and here we are discussing more API tests, so it is connected to server. It's better to choose the language that all developers know. So if they write their backend in Java, it's better to use Java or Kotlin. If they write um, all the code in Node.js, it's better to use JavaScript or TypeScript. The thing is that it's not a must, yes, yeah, not a rule, but if you want to involve your developers in the future, or even if you want to give them this re responsibility, yeah, to, okay, you implemented the feature, please cover it with the test cases. You cannot expect from them that they will learn not only your framework, but the whole language, yeah, from scratch. It's impossible. So the easier you make this way, the better results will be. And if you're not sure about structure, if you cannot use BDD or other approach, just use simple framework like given when then, yeah, for all test cases. You can just put these phrases in comments. It doesn't matter that you need to use, for example, rest assured, yeah, or other frameworks uh, which provides these given when then um, like departments, but you can just make them be a little and be yeah, in the comments. That's really important because that will make your test clearer yeah, and easy to read. And what maybe is not really obvious, but what we are doing in Mira, you need to invest your time mostly, I would say, in two things. First of all, you need to write the documentation. So, okay, you decided that you need to implement your framework or you need to use an existing one and just apply it, uh, adjust it a bit. Okay, you need to write your own documentation. If you use existing framework, it doesn't make sense yet to write the whole documentation again, but you can write down some rules that, okay, guys, we use this framework, but let's consider these three or four rules. You can write something like API manifesto. That's okay. We don't use data providers or we use data providers and we don't use dependent tests and uh, so on. And if you use existing framework, 
investigate the framework functions. The thing is that when I came to Mirwa and I wrote uh, the framework here, I realized that there are a lot of functions that I was not aware of. And I just created, uh, reinvented the wheel again. Yeah, and after a small investigation of source code, I realized that it can be done easier, more in a be more beautiful way, yeah, if I just invested some time on it. So it's really important. Don't think that you know everything. A lot of frameworks are supported right now, and community implements some new features. So keep on uh, keep in touch here yeah, with the community maybe with the github repos and just be aware of new features that might might appear and of course involve other people in the process it's easier to involve qa engineers or you can find one or two developers who are really interested in quality yeah who can write really good integration and unit tests and you can ask their opinion or even give them a try yet yeah, to write test cases using your framework, for example. And um, I wanted to share a list of um, uh, tools that we use for docs. We use the Cosaurus. Maybe Evgeny can share um, his documentation or at least a screenshot of the documentation. It's a really modern tool and it provides a lot of uh, interactive uh, techniques yeah, to make your documentation even more interactive. Of course, you can use README, you can use Confluence, and you are not limited with that. Yeah, but I would highly recommend to consider some modern tooling, because if nobody reads your documentation, it is done in vain. Yeah, so you need to make it as easy as you can, as yeah, simple as you can, and as interactive as it might be. And second thing, uh, third thing, sorry, uh, if there are lots of manual tests here, I think you should invest more time in conducting workshops, how to use your framework. That's what we are doing in Miro right now. So I wrote a tool and second thing, I want people to use that yeah, in their everyday life. The thing is that we need to teach them how to use that because they might be aware of everything about testing, but your tool is new. Yeah, and they really need to get to know their features. And sometimes documentation is not enough. And you need to think about strategy of owners. We have code owners file, for example, for this strategy, but maybe you can use something else. You need to find responsible people for each model. And maybe after a half a year or a year, you can ask them, how is it going? Yeah, And if you can have some like blocking checks, for example, for um, tests yeah, that should be written. And if you have a lot of UI tests, first of all, of course, you need to evaluate the tooling because you have a hidden treasure, I'm sure. You have a hidden treasure of multiple tooling that have been uh, used for a long time before you came, for example, to this project or to this module. It doesn't mean that everything should be thrown away. No, I think that you, you should really evaluate the tools. Maybe you need to rewrite only some of the test cases. The whole principle is that you need to unify the process. And second thing, you need to define the areas where there are a lot of failed UI tests. So maybe they uh, fail because of functional problems. So you can move these test cases from UI level to API level. It will be faster and uh, it won't, uh, it, it will block yeah, the run immediately. So you, you don't need to wait for uh, UI run. And then you will you will need to decide if you want to write a whole framework from scratch or you want to just refactor it. For example, in Miro, we chose the second way. Um, I created the framework, but uh, I based uh, the framework on some rules and frameworks that we used before. And now we're just migrating all the tests. And then you need to define the areas of high priority. Okay, you migrated the tests. Next thing, you need to cover a lot of UI tests 
it might be a first priority, or you can cover, for example, API only areas. Um, in our application, it's, for example, admin panel. It doesn't really matter how good it looks, but it really matters how it works. And here, API is crucial to test. And I think that we are coming to the end because you know, there are a lot of time gone. So what you need to think about? First of all, some basic things. What levels of test cases will you have? You can just use the basic pyramid. OK, you will have unit tests, you will have integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests. You might have even more like system integration testing and component integration testing, end-to-end -end component testing and end-to-end -end system testing. Yes, so we'll, you need to decide. I would say that for each level, you will need a separate approach. It might be a good idea to have the whole approach for all tests, but um, from my perspective, I would say that uh, it doesn't work properly. And if you have one tool, uh, try to use it properly for one test level. Yeah, And if you struggle with applying this tool for a separate level, for example, you used uh, some API tooling well yeah, on system end-to-end -end level for API. But if you see that there are some problems with UI testing with this tool, just change the tool. Yeah, Choose another one. Apply the tool for only one uh, level of testing. Second thing, think about where you will store your models and endpoints. This is a tricky question. Um, we tried to store all the models in our framework, but um, we have a lot of backend teams in Miro, and I didn't realize from the beginning that uh, we are going to change our API a lot. So it's not really convenient. Now we decided to generate models and endpoints and keep them separately. And sec uh, third thing, you need to decide who will be involved in test automation. Only testers or testers and developers? Who from developers will be involved? What level of um, knowledge they have about software testing? You need to define that and conduct some webinars uh, according to their awareness. And some more ideas. First of all, how to notify people about test results? I think you should do it regularly, but how? We implemented some messages in Slack channels. Honestly saying we have at least two or three different channels for auto test, for auto test for release. And maybe you need to implement some individual mentions if you have a strategy for owners. Second thing, when to run. It's also really important. Yes, yeah, so you might have 90 builds, um, but also it might be a good solution to have a run for each build or each merge. We have the second thing, and we try to make our runs as short as we can. Third thing, and yeah, I want to refer to the beginning, yeah, who or what is the consumer of our reports? So we decided that we, we need reports, but it doesn't matter that you need to implement Allure reporting. If you want some colorful reports, yes, you will have to, but if you want to have some metrics, yeah, and you want to evaluate them, you might need to implement some other tooling or use some other reports. So it depends. And also you can use Allure or other reporting to um, use uh, this data in plugins, for example, to block the merge. Yeah, or to just highlight that, okay, guy, uh, your, um, your build compilates fine. Yeah, but we cannot say that about end to end tests. Yeah, so you can consume these metrics in plugins as well. And who will own the tests? You might have a code owner plugin and a file, and you can apply this strategy, or you can just have a team agreement. But you will need to decide. Yeah, And after that, after several months, 
you can introduce some new metrics that you want to increase the coverage. And each model should be covered with at least 50%, 70% of end-to-end -end tests. And challenges that we have right now. So as I said, we have completely or partially implemented all the things that I discussed before, but we have the first challenge. Uh, we have a big monolith. And now we are implementing some new microservices, but the core technology, yeah, the, the, the core functions is uh, uh, fu fu core functions are in monolith. And now we try to consider these opportunities in the future. We are going to separate all functions to different microservices, and we want to implement our frameworks or our tooling so that support this transition in the future. Second thing that we have, we try to keep um, tests really close to the code. For example, we decided to keep the tests with the code yeah, in the same repo, just to let developers and QAs, when they implement new features, write the test cases in the same PR. And there are a lot of problems as well. Um, because our monolith takes a lot of time to build. Third thing that we have, uh, we have a large engineering team, really large with a lot of teams, uh, I think several dozens of teams, and uh, they have all different uh, mindsets and points of view, and it's really difficult to gather in and to find only one solution. And of course, we have different programming languages in use. Um, for API testing, we support uh, Kotlin and Java right now, but we are really looking forward to Node.js as well. And maybe we will use that in the future because some of new microservices are written in this language and we are open to new opportunities as well. And we are switching to API Gateway. So we are going to test not only API directly, but uh, routing as well. Yeah, guys, that's it. I'm open to your questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Cool. We, we have three questions in the QA tab. Yeah, I think I can open them. By positive scenarios, do you mean uh, the happy path? It depends. The thing is that um, I think that you know that we all struggle with um, terminology and yeah, software engineering. As a teacher, I would uh, define happy path as one positive scenario, the main one. Um, but positive scenarios can vary, yeah? And uh, you might have uh, happy path as P0 scenario, but also you can have P1, P2, P3. For example, you need to register a new user. And first of all, you will um, enter the email, like your, your name at gmail.com. But also you can use some different symbols in the first user part, yeah, and in the second part. But I don't think that it is a part of happy path scenario. Yeah, they are not so important. So they will be positive scenarios, but not at P0, um, but at P1 or P2 priority. Yeah, if I haven't answered your question, just type, please, <laughs> the, the, the further questions below. Okay, uh, how, do you how do you update traceability matrix? Who is responsible for that? Um, so, yeah, I, I think I haven't said that. Um, in Miro, I'm a part of SDT team, team, so we kind of service team. I'm not a um, part of QA pr project process, but I provide tooling. That's why um, I'm talking about um, API, yeah, API tools, API frameworks, because I'm like an author yeah, of, of this framework and Miro. Um, but I think it's really crucial to make everyone responsible who is going to update your test cases. Or it's a first thing, but if you have a really large team, it might be not a good solution because it will be a mess. So you can have, um, for example, um, a manager, yeah, or you can call it a responsible person, yeah, or something like that. And uh, this person can review 
the whole scenarios, for example, once a um, week or once a day. Third thing that we implemented, um, we had uh, acceptance criteria of each uh, feature. Before we can start testing, we need to write all the test cases. Write to all the test cases mean that, okay, you not just write test cases in your TMS, but also you updated the map. Uh, before our, this presentation, I tried to find some automated solutions, but honestly saying I haven't found that. So I think it's a good idea for a startup. Um, Alexandra asks, why do you prefer to use manual mind map if there are enough automated tooling that allows to link API documentation with TMS and test coverage automatically? It's a good point. The thing is that um, if you use Swagger or a Open API or other tooling, it might be a good thing to use everything automatically. But there is a thing that uh, you don't take into consideration, it's a test analysis. And I believe that you cannot uh, create a good bunch of tests yeah, with the whole coverage automatically. You will need to consider it yourself. Yeah, You need to evaluate the requirements. And that can be done only manually. But if you, if you know this tooling that can combine these two approaches, so you can just generate something, yeah, and then you can add some tests, for example, uh, manually, Please share in comments, we will consider it. And the last one. Oh, okay. Okay, I will. Uh -huh, Anna, um, how can I explain to the customer the importance of testing API if he does not uh, if he does not want to allocate time? Mm -hmm. Um Okay, for, for this, uh, is it possible to start without involving stakeholders? The thing is that there are two approaches. Yeah, I will share both of them. Uh, first of all, of course, it's better to be transparent as much as you can. Yeah, and say that, okay, I want to um, invest the time in the API testing. But the thing is that sometimes it's not possible. Yeah, and API testing is not really demonstrated. Yeah, let's say. And that's why a lot of projects just have UI tests with video recordings and screenshots, yeah, et cetera. So what you can do? You can do that simultaneously. So you have a bunch of test cases that you need to automate in UI. Some test cases you can have in UI and some on API. And if you want to, you can evaluate the time properly. So for example, you know that for one UI test case, you need to invest, I don't know, one hour, two hours maybe. Yeah, you can add more time to each test case, maybe one hour plus, just to cover some API tests. It worked for me. Uh, the thing is that, uh, not every customer is really a technical guy, first of all, and even if they are, they can evaluate your own pace. So after some time, they will see that, okay, your tests really catch some bugs. Yes, yeah, so it's not really a problem to have some API tests. And if they see after a while, maybe after two or three months, that some tests catch the bug, it doesn't really matter what type of test case it is. Yeah, so for them, it's really important to see the whole picture. And what is, is this case about? Is it API or UI? It doesn't matter for them. And yeah, I hope that I answered. And the last one, Jan, what would be a good way to have version control of docs and uh, test automation codes? So I will share my own experience with Miro. Uh, we have one pipeline for, um, uh, for tooling yeah, and for documentation. So we have two stages, like compilation and testing. And the second stage is API documentation. So it is up to date. And also um, we have only one um, like flow, yeah, so we have some branches, but branches do not update the documentation, only master can. And it is uh, confirmed that other guys, yeah, for example, developers should use only master. So they are uh, always up to date. 
And if you want to update their documentation, it's not a problem anymore. Yeah, you will just increase the, the number of versions. So it will be 1.0.96. Yeah, and when you update the documentation, it will be next one. It will be accessible from the website. Yeah, so it won't be a problem. But the code, yeah, the, the whole code will be the same. So in this case, it's, it, it doesn't matter yeah, how many changes you made, for example, in your docs. Okay, oh guys, God. thanks a lot. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was pretty nice. And yeah, I think now if you have more questions, you can still add the questions on the QA and we are gonna try to answer it offline uh, and yeah now i think we can move forward to the next uh, presenter uh, eugene when you're ready sure hey everyone do you hear me right all good with yeah. the sound cool let's share my screen so i'm here to talk a little bit about ui tests specifically about flaky tests because I know it's a pain point for, for pretty much everyone who is who, who is touching UI, automated UI tests. So, and I'm gonna talk about our internal tool for UI tests, which is called Spectator, and how does it help us to uh, to to solve at least some of the flakiness. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about sources of flakiness in UI testing. I'm gonna only focus on the points which are we are facing in Miro, but I'm pretty sure it will correlate with uh, other projects, other companies. I'm gonna talk about uh, Spectator, uh, our internal tool for UI testing, and basically how it solves, uh, how it helps us to fight flaky tests. And then we'll reserve some time for Q and A. So to start with, I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Evgeny, and I'm software development engineer in test. And my passion is actually UI testing. And I have uh, five years of experience in building of UI test tooling and frameworks. And um, to add to, to this, I'm a strong ship left approach supporter because it might be it might sound obvious, but the, the earlier you test your product, uh, the cheaper it is <laughs> to, to fix the, the, the issues. So uh, let's first start with, uh, with a definition of a flaky test. So the, the, mo the most generic and common definition is a flaky test is the test that fails to produce the, the same result every time it, it, it's being executed. So meaning it's producing uh, inconsistent results. So basically it's not trustworthy, tr trustworthy. And in most cases it happens uh, because the test code is not stable. So let's briefly talk about uh, the reasons uh, why the tests, the UI, UI tests can be flaky. So again, I'm only focusing on the points that we're facing here in Miro, this list can be endless, and I'm, <laughs> I know that uh, if I will talk about all possible reasons of flakiness, we will never finish this <laughs> the, this uh, presentation. But uh, the most common uh, source of flakiness is that the browser action is performed too fast. I will be talking more about this later on. I will just want to bullet point uh, all the all the sources for now. So the next one is when we fetch real HTML element too fast. Uh, then since we're talking about uh, Miro, uh, uh, we, we need to, to have screenshot comparing, visual comparing, because uh, working with Canvas uh, is not always possible to use more conventional types of assertions like element is visible or something uh, that text contains or something like that, because we're working with canvas, there are no elements on the screen. 
So the next point is that uh, we might have different setup on our local machines and on our CI system, which can produce different uh, results by executing tests locally and on CI. And uh, the last but not least point is that UI end-to-end -end tests are very uh, heavy for execution. They're slow. Uh, they involve a lot of uh, different parts of your system, and that might also cause a lot of flackiness. So basically, now let's let's talk about every point in more detail. But first, I want to give you a short intro about our internal tool, Spectator. So what is Spectator? Spectator is a UI test tool powered by Playwright, which is an open source uh, tooling. Pretty pretty young, but uh, yeah, it's it's trending and uh, the number of users is growing every month. So our tool is using Playwright as an engine and it supports basically three levels of uh, UI testing, not only end-to-end, -end, but also component and integration. We support multi-browser testing. For now, it's Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. And uh, basically what uh, makes it different from, from uh, plain Playwright is that we uh, wrap a lot of uh, Miro APIs and a lot of methods working with Canvas inside of our tool, which makes it ready to use out of the box for, uh, for our QA engineers and front-end developers. So if we deep dive a little bit in the tech side, so what is Spectator? So it's a tooling which is written in TypeScript and supporting any TypeScript project. It's powered by Playwright Engine. We're using Jest as our test running, uh, Allure test ops for reporting. And uh, we support currently two CI systems, Jenkins and Bamboo CI. And so uh, we are uh, working on implementation for supporting GitLab. So basically what we are trying to resolve with uh, Spectator. So Obviously, it's not uh, the first uh, test automation framework for UI tests in, in Miro. So we did have an old legacy framework, but uh, the problems with it. So it was that it was really hard to to dive into this framework and to start writing tests. So we we had we still have Java framework with limited number of contributors. Uh, we have around. 30 or 40 QA engineers and more than, I think, 300 developers. So, and developers are not using Java that much, especially front-end engineers. So they are not really willing to, uh, to write UI tests in a different language. So basically our approach here is to open, uh, open this opportunity to more people uh, simply to all front-end engineers. So that's uh, that was the, the problem. So the second biggest problem is flaky tests. So the old framework was blocking a lot of releases due to flaky tests. So a lot of things were uh, failing here and there, and we have zero percentage rule. So meaning that no tests can fail to, to be able to release the specific build. So basically flaky test is a pain point for us. So the next problem was that the tests are not part of the code. They are living in a separate repository, meaning that uh, a lot of features, a lot of uh, product code can go live without being covered by UI tests. Right now, okay, I will talk what, uh, what we have right now a little bit later. Right now we're talking about problems and not clear reports and logs. So in the old framework, the Allure reports, they were simply missing logs, uh, attachments, screenshots, uh, stuff like that. So uh, it was not easy or transparent to understand what, what's going on with the fa uh, failing tests and uh, what to do with it. So, and now why spectator? So first of all, uh, we have low entry barrier to contribute to QA processes. It's a very straightforward process to set up uh, this tool. It has limited entry points to start writing the tests, only three entry points. It has the same language as front-end code. So basically front-end engineers are not, uh, so they, 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 
they know how to write in TypeScript or JavaScript, so it makes it easier for them. And same test structure as front-end unit tests, because we're using Jest as our test runner, and the, the tests are looking exactly the same as the majority of front-end unit tests. Uh, so the, the, the next solution, uh, the, the next thing that Spectator helps us to solve, that's uh, uh, now cover, writing the tests and writing the product code uh, is, um, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, first of all, that Spectator is a standalone library, NPM library, which can be installed in any TypeScript project. So the tests and the code are living in the same repository and then can, can be merged in the same pull request. So the, 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 the risk of merging untested code is minimized here. And tests can be executed against any environment. So we are promoting here shift left uh, approach, uh, meaning that uh, the tests, uh, that the code can be tested with and covered with UI tests as early as possible. So Finally, Spectator helps to increase the stability of the test and simplify the bug process. So I will talk about this in more detail. So we have a lot of uh, custom wrappers uh, and automatic weights and weighting strategies embedded in our internal interfaces. We have uh, stable mechanisms to compare screenshots. We have uh, retry reruns mechanisms for fail test cases. And uh, yeah, we, we did a lot of effort to make our reports uh, clear, readable, and understandable by everyone, not only to the authors of, uh, of the tests. So now let's dive into the sources of blackness and how our tooling helps us to, to resolve that. The first one was that the browser action is performed too fast. So here I, I tried to demonstrate uh, well, uh, that sometimes we have uh, on the browser side, we have UI element loaded. And then during the load, uh, there is a, G a JavaScript action being attached to this element. But in, mo uh, in, in mo uh, not in most cases, but in some cases, we get this element, right? Uh, when it's been loaded, but we click on it too early or do anything with it too early before it's becoming functional. So we click on it and the test fails here or gets uh, broken. So another, uh, so in, in some cases, what I have seen from my experience, what people do, they just add some, some sleep between this uh, getting element and clicking on the elements. But this is not a sustainable approach because end-to-end -end UI tests uh, can, can uh, produce different timings during different executions because of environment uh, conditions and so on. So what will be this X seconds be? So no one knows. And uh, so what we try to implement here, so, uh, all right, we can get an element, we can click on it and then check, did something happen? Did, did uh, the click uh, produce the results that we were expecting? So uh, if, if, there were, if uh, nothing happened, we can just retry, right? So until a certain timeout is reached. And if something happens, we proceed further with the test. So another approach that uh, we could try here. So uh, we can listen to uh, uh, JavaScript events and wait until required event is triggered, which is a more sustainable approach in my opinion. So we get the elements, listen to events. And once we receive some events, we click on the element, which makes the tests more stable. So, uh, basically, we can talk about uh, page loading. So when we navigate to, to the page, the page starts loading. So especially if we're talking about Miro, this page can take a lot of time to, to be loaded, especially if you have uh, heavy boards uh, and a lot of widgets and elements on it. So uh, basically, we have automatic waiting for 
uh, specific events, ev events before we actually continue with test execution. So we start waiting for a uh, page load to be complete and only after all things uh, happened, all events are registered, uh, we continue test execution. Uh, so in some cases, the clicks can trigger navigation, right? So basically if I, uh, I won't be clicking any, anywhere here not to, to lose the result, but uh, just imagine if you have some go to button, you click on it and it triggers navigation. Here we have the same embedded mechanisms, mechanisms which work out of the box, which are finishing waiting to page to, to be completely loaded. And only then we continue with test execution. Uh, so also, uh, we can uh, wait until element is fully loaded uh, by uh, also our internal embedded mechanisms uh, and waiting until some uh, GS actions were attached and only then we perform action on element. So this was the, the first part. So basically everything is uh, focused on uh, wrapping some automated weights for page loading, for element loading, and other things which require some time for the browser to, to get uh, your page, your application fully functional. So another pain point that we faced that uh, in, in the old framework, we were fetching or saving real HTML element objects too fast. So what, what is happening here? So we a browser loads some element and we get it right away after it's being loaded. But sometimes the element is being updated. The JavaScript being updated or other things on the HTML side being updated. And we click on the element uh, after after this update. So we get this nasty stale element reference or not existing elements and things like that. So what we're doing in Miro instead, we are not saving the object with the element. We're only uh, referring to this element by XPath, by CSS or any other type of uh, selector. And we get element right before we need to perform some action or with this element, it can be click or whatever else, but we never store the object uh, during the runtime because uh, this can be updated anytime and we cannot control this. So as I mentioned, we are working a lot with screenshot comparison and this part can get really flaky if you don't do it right. So, just uh, to illustrate it, so uh, the for the screenshot comparison, we need a baseline image and a baseline screenshot and runtime screenshot to compare these two to, uh, between each other. And uh, basically, the problem here is that the element that we can see with our own eyes, the runtime screenshot and the baseline screenshot can be completely three different things. So this is caused by uh, two problems mainly. So that our baseline is not correct because we took, our, took and saved our baseline image uh, in, in a not proper way before elements were fully loaded, rendered or whatever else. And the same happens with the runtime screenshot. So we take the runtime screenshot too fast, too early without waiting and things like that. So uh, this can cause a lot of flackiness. So basically how we approach these things in, uh, in our tooling. So for the baseline, we have some safety mechanisms to ensure that our baseline is truly stable and it's not uh, changing. So, uh, with the difference of a small interval, we take two screenshots and compare them between each other. If they are the same, then it means, okay, we have stable baseline and we can save it, safely save it because it's, uh, it's a good result. 
And if not, we uh, repeat the process again until we make sure that we get a stable baseline. So in this way, we can minimize the risk of having incorrect baseline screenshot. The same happens for uh, comparing the baseline with a runtime screenshot. So we start here and uh, we compare our baseline and runtime. And if they're not identical, we repeat retaking the runtime screenshot and keep going in this loop until our timeout is reached. Uh, and if timeout is reached, but screenshots are still not identical, we still we exit screenshot comparison with a negative result, meaning that screenshots are not uh, similar or not identical, and it will be a failed test. But yeah, if the screenshots are identical, we exit with a positive result. But here we don't do like immediate check and exit uh, with. Uh, uh, with a non-fully loaded runtime screenshot and things like that. So we, again, uh, reduce the chances of uh, taking uh, the wrong runtime screenshot. So uh, moving forward, uh, we can have a different setups on our local machine and in our CI system. So to illustrate this, so if I'm a tester or front-end engineer, I write the test case. Uh, for example, I have Windows or uh, MacBook. I, I do my running debugging locally on my machine. Everything passed, I push the test. And CI, which is mainly running in Docker or in general in Linux environment, uh, might produce some different results and broken and we, we might end up with a broken or flaky test due to operating system or environment differences. This is uh, uh, very often the case for a screenshot comparison when we have some rendering differences between uh, operating systems, between the fonts, between the colors, and so on. So it doesn't mean that your application is not working. You just have the wrong uh, baseline generated in a different operating system. So how we, do we tackle uh, this situation uh, in Miro? So we don't run our, we don't uh, run and debug our test cases in our own operating system. We provide exactly the same conditions and as we have in CI. We have exactly the same Docker image that we're using in our CI, exactly the same version of operating system and uh, running tests locally will be exactly the same conditions as we run them in CI. So in this case, we're simply minimizing the risk that uh, the, test, the test result will be different than it was locally. It also simplifies the debug process because sometimes uh, it happens that uh, the test failed in CI and you cannot reproduce this issue locally just because of these uh, environment differences. So the, the last but not least point is that UI tests are the most heavy uh, part of, of testing in general, because they're very slow. They require a lot of things to be prepared in advance, like environments, APIs, and things like that. And if we look at the end-to-end -end level, we require full deployment of all system components, uh, uh, we can face environment or network issues during execution. Uh, we have real APIs and endpoints used for our end-to-end -end UI tests, and uh, we have very slow execution. So our approach here at Miro is that we try to uh, move our end-to-end -end tests to component level. So, which will mean that the tests can run against the current build. They don't require a full deployment and all components of the system. So tests can be executed against the local server, which is uh, spun up in uh, CI, and then you mount your component or UI, uh, uh, UI part. So you can use mocked backend responses so which eliminates the risk of uh, some API being slow or timing out. And as a result, we get the very fast execution 
uh, sometimes it's uh, dozens time, times faster than end-to-end uh, -end UI testing. So, but overall, uh, we still have flaky tests. So we are not, I'm not trying to tell that our solution is, is the, <laughs> Uh, solves all the issues. So majority of our UI tests are still on end-to-end -end level. So we occasionally have issues with endpoints responsiveness, with uh, timing out APIs and things like that. Uh, no matter how uh, we try with screenshot comparison, it's still not 100% stable. So it's, it's not blocking every second release, but still we might have issues with uh, pixel comparison. And uh, by, with Spectator, we provide a lot of wrappers for, for our browser or Canvas actions, but they are not, the, not all of them are wrapped inside uh, this safe commands, which will be retrying uh, or waiting. So in some cases, there is uh, still a lot of things to do here to ensure that uh, we don't use unsafe commands or actions uh, in our tests. So which uh, leads to our future plans. So first of all, we want to avoid screenshot comparison where it's not really needed. So for example, if we can replace it with uh, conventional assertions like element is visible, elements contain, element contains text or whatever else. So we always uh, want to go for that. So it's not yet in place, but yeah, we will be working on reduction of the number of screenshot comparisons in our tests. So we, we are heavily working on, um, on the part to move uh, mo uh, some of our end-to-end -end tests to lower levels, to component and integration, because uh, to be honest, not all the test cases are required to be end-to-end -end tests. Uh, we are still working on providing browser and canvas commands with safer try mechanisms. And uh, we want to start working with mocked backend uh, responses instead of using our APIs, which, which are not always uh, working very fast and reliable on all our out of test environments. That was it from my side. I'm ready to, to the questions. Oh, for now, I think we have just one question in yeah. the QA tab. To use real browsers for component tests or something like JS. No, now we use uh, real browsers, but in headless mode. We use uh, Chromium, we use WebKit and Firefox, if this answers your question. Cool. Maybe something in the chat. Could you share a link to the spectator? Uh, what do you mean by link? Uh, unfortunately, it's not an open source tool, so I cannot just give you the source code. Probably I could give you the documentation, but I'm not sure if it's publicly available. Okay, so what is different between Cypress and Spectator? So uh, fundamentally, we're building pretty much the similar tool as uh, Cypress, Playwright, WebDriver.io, uh, but we try to make it easier for our front-end engineers and QA engineers to work with Miro-specific methods with our SDKs, with our APIs, with, uh, with the Canvas, because um, if we take Playwright, Cypress, or whatever other open source tool, uh, you need to do a lot of preparation to, to get it ready to, to be used for, for a complex application like Miro. So because we're not talking here about HTML elements, so in most cases it's Canvas, and in Canvas, yeah, it's not really easy to operate with, with Canvas with like a raw, plain, open source tool. Uh, 
on what do you use to run your test in isolation and scale in CI? So our end-to-end -end tests are running in Jenkins. So we, uh, we parallel them in, uh, uh, based on spec files. So every spec files runs in a separate machine, which is, uh, which is always clean. So meaning that uh, we have uh, fresh browsers. So each test is being executed in a completely uh, fresh environment, so to speak. So scale in CI. So we, yeah, we have this auto scaling mechanism. So we have the EC2 machines, which are spinned up on demand. Basically, when the test uh, has to be executed, we spin up uh, machines uh, for, for, for these tests. And when the no tests are running, these machines basically dying. I think we have one question in the chat. Uh, how you will keep mocks in update state? Uh, that's a good question. So as I mentioned, it's, uh, uh, we, we still don't have uh, these uh, features in place like uh, mocked. Uh, backends mocked api responses so we'll be thinking and designing this in the upcoming weeks and months so yeah i don't have a, a definite answer to these questions at the moment cool if no no one has any more question uh, if you have, you can also ask in the QA and we can try to answer it offline. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Thanks a lot. Really good, really good presentation. Yeah. And thank you. It is your work is really helping us in the front end. So me as a front end engineer, I, I really like it. Uh, cool. Thank you again. And I think now we can move to our special guest, uh, Andre. And yeah, Andre, if you are ready, yeah. you can share a screen. Yeah. Hi, all. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yep. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm really proud to be a special guest here. So yeah, let me share my screen. OK. OK, can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. OK. So. Um, First of all, I would like to say, yeah, thank you for participating me. Yeah, the mirror is a really great tool. I use it a lot. And also I'd like to say thank you for them who are still staying with us, who survived after the presentation. I think we a little bit run out of time on our track. And I'm, I will try to um, quickly yeah, explain my uh, presentation. And uh, okay, um, let me introduce myself. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Andrei Bravko. I'm working as a quality architect in uh, the Contori company. Uh, the company is a software um, engineering company uh, which um, implemented um, software in such area as um, life science. Uh, it's mean like um, uh, medicine, pharma, and chemist. Uh, areas. So we have a lot of uh, scientists working closely with us and I'm going to explain how, um, so we invented some approach and I'm going to explain how this approach helps us to work together um, uh, efficient. And yeah, first of all, uh, so you could see the, um, let me point out. Oh pointer you can see the um, uh, name of the presentation is this case as code and let me elaborate this so uh, probably you could hear about infrastructure as a code documentation is the code it was previously now we have this case as code and what does it mean so um, it's mean that we have uh, our test cases but uh, written in the uh, let's say text file in some formatted uh, way. And um, of course it's useful to you uh, to have a version control system. So I could say that uh, the uh, this case is code is this cases which written 
and uh, stored in the version control system. And uh, why PDD, you uh, will know answer during my presentation. Uh, so the idea of my presentation, let's say was born after a couple of, um, um, couple of uh, speeches from the uh, different conferences, uh, Sergei Piragovich's uh, explained this approach, yeah, and uh, Artyom Yeroshenko, but uh, the guys, um, they, uh, explain how to do this approach using, you know, like a plain um, uh, programming language, right? So here you, you could see the name of the test, right? Uh, steps, yeah, uh, which is described here. And I start thinking, uh, what it looks like a BDD, which we use, right? So if we separate the code from the uh, test name and steps name, won't it be the same as BDD? Uh, can we say that BDD is a test case as a code as well, but BDD like was born earlier and yeah, it's the same. And now, um, yeah, I've removed all the code and I have this scenario as you could see, and it's uh, actually similar, right? But uh, under all of the uh, this line, uh, we have a um, source code. For example, if we take a look for step open notes page, right? Um, we can have here like um, a usual uh, UI uh, Selenium methods like navigate to some uh, URL, right? So uh, now I can say that BDD is uh, the same as approach as this case as code. And how we use it uh, on our projects, right? So uh, let's start with a problematic, right? Uh, what we actually solved. Uh, the first problem is test automation lag. What does it mean? Uh, first of all, in like regular teams, um, which doesn't use PDD, let's say, uh, the process um, looks like uh, this so the uh, manual engineer uh, create a test case in some uh, test management system, then create a zero um, ticket for automate uh, this uh, test scenario. Next, uh, it's go to the some queue and test automation engineer start automating, uh, and system of course change it uh, during this time and. Um, Test automation engineer asking for, oh, sorry, update. And um, it's take a lot of time, right? To write this um, automation test and when this test will be in our regression suite and will run in pipeline. The next problem as well, uh, like a test automation lag when we need to update this test case. So uh, this case could be updated in test management system but it's also required to update in our repository yeah, with the source code. And also usually test automation engineers, uh, they are not deeply understand business logic, right? And when test failed, right? It's um, test automation engineers, it's hard to uh, analyze and understand what happened, yeah? And this is the problem, right? Uh, the next uh, like problem is uh, uh, for most of the test management system, there is no version control. So we can't track yeah, changes in our test cases, test scenario. Also, it is hard to do branching. Yeah, we have a new version system in some branch or several branches, yeah, some new features, but we can't like create a branch and create a test case and test management system. And um, also there is a problem, problem with review for good quality of test cases. Yeah, I believe that it is required to review from the team, right? And especially for newcomers, because uh, after some time we create some abbreviations. We usually not uh, 
write our test cases so detailed and yeah the ptt approach helps to solve this problem uh why because uh we start working on the same area so bdd scenario uh it's the same uh, as a manual test case and automation test case and how we uh use uh, this test case as manual i will uh share with you later uh so but i think uh, the most important part uh, is to help us collaborate us i mean uh, automation engineers and manual engineers so we starting working on the same field and because the test case becomes uh, automation and manual yeah in the, in the same way uh, so this problem uh, disappeared right and let me uh, explain you uh, our let's say test approach or test strategy and here on this diagram uh, which was created in Miro by the way <laughs> um, I can show our tools right so all of the process spin around the feature file around the scenario so all the team uh, analytics developers quality engineers everyone write this scenario uh, in the given when then uh, way and it's the same uh, it simultaneously it's uh, requirements and documentation manual and automation test so it's which is really cool and it saves time yeah and to help so next we have two let's say branches the first branch is a test automation so we have an open source framework which is called behavioral automation uh, uh, which has uh, the let's say default uh, steps uh, which we use to explain our scenario and which can be uh, run yeah, and executed in browser and it's uh, as usual goes to the ci cd system and to test reporting system we use test report now uh, next we will analyze this failing test if we have such and the next branch and the tool which i will describe in more detail uh, further it's a gherkin sync tool i i think you could agree that it is hard to do uh, test runs having only uh, let's say text documents in git right so we used to uh, use a test management system so the tool uh, what uh, they do uh, the tool takes these files from the uh, repo and synchronize it with test management system yeah so for now it's a test rail and azure devops and it is become easily to uh, create a test run from these scenarios and yeah execute actually it so it's like a manual branch for testing uh, and here is the slide which describe what actually gherkin sync tool uh, does so it's took uh, the scenario from the file and put it to the test rail and then we will create a test run and have such beautiful report and here is a quickly uh, yeah uh, simplified architecture schema so it's like uh, based on the interfaces i'm not going to deep dive here so but the main idea is that because here is an in interfaces you could implement your own test management system not only azure devops and test rail you could add uh, any other system here is the configuration so the main point is to point um, to show uh, gherkin sync tool where the feature files are located so it could be oh sorry it could be um, uh, absolute pass here to folder folder with the feature files or uh, uh, or in the same directory so and also uh, and other configuration so i'm not going to deep dive here and let me quickly uh, show you like a demo how it's work for example we have a scenario right so here is uh, the two scenario in one feature file 
one of them uh, is like a scenario outline, which has um, examples here, table. And let's say that the first scenario uh, could be executed automatically, right? And for those scenario, we put uh, usually take automated here. And when we create a test run in test management system, we just ignore, uh, filter this uh, test and not execute it manually. Of course, yeah, because it's running CICD. Then we use our magic uh, tool, which uh, looks like this. It's a, uh, let's say, uh, it's an open source, yeah, again, and um, could be run on any platform tool. Um, so here are the logs, and we can see that uh, the tool found uh, the uh, one feature file and created couple of scenario in test trail. Then in test trail, uh, we will see the these two scenario. First of um, so here is the name, uh, everything here, feature and um, description steps. So everything is here. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, the first scenario is automated. So we have a tag automated here, put it here. The second scenario, like uh, parameterized and we have a table here. Uh, so let's go next. Uh, and finally, the tool put, uh, puts the uh, IDs from the test trail here under this scenario keyword to be able to update and synchronize this test case in the future. So, uh, the point of truth is the Git. So if we change something in the Git in this file, uh, the tool will automatically uh, update the test rail according to the changes in the file. And also it is useful uh, to have a report, for example, because tool populated the uh, automation type, references, priority, so we can uh, create a report uh, how many tests do we have so it's like a four ui and uh, 16 api test and uh, 120 uh, manual tests and we can uh, calculate coverage right and also yeah here is the reference coverage it's like a coverage of requirements uh, also i would like to say that I'm not recommend to run this tool manually, right? I would like uh, you to run it in some pipeline uh, to make life easier. Uh, and here is the diagram which explain how we uh, uh, configure our CI CD system. Yeah. So in quick words, it's like uh, when something changes in the folder with the feature files, uh, we trigger our pipeline, create uh, so we have a branch and we run tool, uh, commit and push changes with this uh, text, which uh, contain IDs from test trail. And then we using the API, we create a pull request and that's it. So, uh, and uh, here is a quick statistic. Yeah. So it's from the real project uh, we have uh, 1,266 tests and for test rail, it takes uh, seven uh, or eight minutes to synchronize and for Azure DevOps from 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, why such a difference? Because Azure DevOps has like a more uh, fast API, yeah, which is uh, included like a batch request, but test rail doesn't have batch request. Okay, and um, let me summarize here. So uh, the tool which we use for, uh, let's say, uh, collaborate between automation and manual testers, uh, tests uh, is a code agnostic, right? You could use it whether you have Java, JavaScript, Python, uh, .NET, everything. So it's only uh, required a Jurgen syntax in the files and that's it. So 
it could be useful in any stack. And uh, also it could be helpful for creating reports yeah, for coverage as I shown previously. And the main point, uh, which from my point of view is more important, is it's uh, breakdown barrier. So now we can work together on the same field and uh, the manual testers and automation testers could work together using the same tool, using the same approach, and it makes our work more efficient. So uh, that's it. Here is the uh, link to this uh, Gherkin Sync tool. Uh, and yeah, so it's again, it's open source. Yeah, here is our uh, repository. Here is uh, some instruction here, how to use it, how to install parameters, etc. Yeah, so everything is here. Yeah, that's it from me. Yeah. Thanks for your attention. And who is still with us? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Andre, and thank you, yeah, everyone that uh, stayed with us. Uh, yeah, as, sorry, uh, it, it ended up taking a bit more time, but uh, I really like your presentation. And I don't know, uh, someone has any questions? Feel free to ask. Looks like there is no questions. And I, I have one question to be honest, Andre. And uh, I was looking at your presentation and also this uh, ability to have the automated and also the not automated tests, let's say the manual tests. And uh, in your process, like when, when you are running these tests, it is on the build, it is, uh, you are running periodically like at night or uh, when, when the tests are, are, are running to, to make sure uh everything is working correctly yeah you know so we have um, a lot of projects here yeah, and the approach could be different from different projects right and usually we have some smoke suit for each build right and the like a big amount of test aggregation suit which is run every night but uh, if you have uh, like a quick after uh, automation right you could run uh, yeah, all amount of tests, like each build, I think uh, as quicker you run the test, it's uh, like more beneficial, yeah, because you will have uh, information about your system, what's going on, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very yeah, much thank, thank for you. your presentation. Oh, and uh, yeah, I hope we can uh, talk more uh, about of this in other sessions as well. And uh, now I think, yeah, we can start the end, let's say. So I, I will share uh, my screen just for some few slides. Let me share it here. Uh, yep. So yeah, now I think, yeah, I would like to share with you some links uh, of Miro. The first one is our career page. So we have many positions open. So yeah, if you are looking for some opportunity and you are uh, uh, a QA engineer or any other engineer as well, you can join this, uh, go to this page and look for something. Uh, and uh, also, if you uh, wanna keep in touch with us, uh, you can first give your feedback on this link in the presentation. So you can go to the presentation and open this link where we have a form for a feedback to the session. So I will also share this uh, in the chat here. And uh, I would like to say thank you very much uh, for everyone that joined it. And yeah, keep, let's keep in touch. Join our Miro Engineering Meetup group. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn and yeah, we can see each other on next events. And thank you for all the presenters, all the speakers and everyone that was with us today. Thank you very much for joining. <laughs>